Is it true rusty Italian cars from the 70s were made from old Soviet tanks and warships? Hello everybody, welcome to number 27. Now, Italian cars have traditionally suffered, more than most others, for a reputation for rust, particularly the ones made in the 1970s. And the perceived wisdom, the story that has been doing the rounds, is that that was caused by them using inferior quality Russian-Soviet steel. Could it be possible that this was all a clever ploy by the Soviets to hurt the Italians? We will cripple those horrible Italian capitalist pigs. We will give them inferior quality steel so that they make really shoddy cars, their industry collapses, and then they become good communist brothers like us. Well, no. Intentionally or unintentionally, there was no Russian steel that was supplied in making Alfa Romeos of this time. It is a complete myth. I'm going to tell you the story surrounding this. It's a story that involves the USSR. The Vietnam War, one of the designers of the Tiger Tank, the most powerful Mafia boss in Italy, and finally, some British tea bags? This demonstration will show how Tetley's 2,000 perforations let flavour flood out. Well, in the UK, the reputation for rust that the Alpha Sud had was so bad that they were often nicknamed Tetley after the T for having 2,000 perforations, i.e. being so rusty they had loads of holes in them. Up until a couple of weeks ago, I was also a complete believer in the Russian steel myth. Things changed because I did a video on an Alpha Sud. I did a road test. Now, I loved the car, but I repeated the often said thing that the rust was down to the inferior quality of the steel that had come from Soviet plants. And of course, the infamous Russian steel played a part as well. A few people corrected me, and in particular, Chris Martin, who has written a book on the Alpha Sud, Alpha Sud, The Complete Story, which is a fantastic read, by the way. I really recommend it. Anyway, I had a bit of correspondence with him, and he confirmed that most of it's in the book, that the story of Russian steel has absolutely no substantiation, that it looks like it was merely, it's something that's quite accepted in English-speaking countries, isn't really mentioned anywhere else, and there is absolutely no basis for it. So I used the book as a bit of a guide to then do also some more research. And in this video, I will show you why that whole story makes no sense and has no grounding. It is absolutely true that in the 1970s in particular, Italian car makers suffered a terrible reputation for rust. But this is largely attributable to two models, the Alfa Sud and the Lancia Beta. Now you have to remember that in 1970, all cars rusted pretty badly. For example, the E21 BMW, a car that has a wonderful reputation, in many ways understood it was quite groundbreaking for BMW, but it rusted really badly on the rear arches, in the boot, and on the floors of the car. The truth is that most Italian cars were really no worse than many of their contemporaries. The Alfa Sud and the Beta, however, were a different kettle of fish. An example of how bad that was can be found in Chris Martin's book. Now, Chris worked at Hexagon in London in the 1970s. That was one of Alpha's main dealers. I think it was in North London. The problem got so bad that they had to set up a custom-made, state-of-the-art paint shop, and they had windscreen fitters coming in every day to remove front and rear screen windscreen for cars that then had to be fixed, rust cut out, put back, and repainted. So it must have been something that really cost Alpha dearly. So where does this theory of this being caused by inferior Russian steel actually come from? Well, in the, the mid-60s, Fiat did a deal with the Soviet Union to help them make cars, in exchange for which, in theory, the Soviets provided them they paid them in steel, and this steel was inferior quality, recycled and made from old rusting T-34 tanks and old battleships. It is true that Fiat did a deal with the Soviets. It sold them the tooling for the Fiat and the rights to produce the Fiat 124, which led on to the Vaz automaker, or Lada as we know it here in Europe. Now, there are two Italians who are primarily responsible for this deal. There was Palmiro Togliatti, who was the head of the Italian Communist Party, but perhaps even more instrumental 
was Piero Savoretti. He was an avowed Italian communist. He was one of the first Westerners to open business links um, with the communists in Russia. He was present in 1966 when the then president of Fiat, who was uh, Gianni Agnelli, met up and signed over this deal. And you can just see Savoretti there in the background in one of the pictures taken at the time. This was actually quite a contentious deal because effectively Fiat would be transferring Western technology to the Soviet Union. And don't forget, this was the culmination and the peak of the Cold War era. So in order to do this deal, Fiat had to seek the approval of the Americans. And we'll see why this is relevant to this story a little bit later. I think it's now safe to say that the stories about Russian steel are patently untrue. Definitely in the case of Alfa Romeo, possibly also for Fiat and Lancia, but we'll talk more about the last two a bit later in this video. Now, there are several reasons that lead me to believe this and others <laughs> to believe this. Now, the first is that Alfa Romeo was actually not part of Fiat until 1986. Therefore, it wouldn't be sourcing its metal from the same parts. If Fiat was indeed getting this steel from the Soviet Union, well, Alfa Romeo wasn't getting it from there. The second reason is that Italy at the time was actually one of the second largest producers in Europe of steel and it suffered from overproduction. Now the Alpha Sud project was given backing and funds from the Italian government on the condition that it was used as a project to help the underdeveloped south of Italy. So as a result, Alfa Romeo built the Pomigliano factory close to Naples. There is very quite close by in Taranto, there was this gigantic steel plant. It would make absolutely no sense for them to say, let's build this car factory there, but let's then import the steel from the Soviets. There is backing for this from a working paper from the Bank of Italy in 2010, in which this paper says that the production of the Alpha Sud was always conceived to go hand in hand with the steel plant in Taranto. This is where, bizarrely, the Vietnam War comes in and this puts a final nail in the coffin of this theory. Now, at the time, America was engaged in the war in Vietnam and it was having quite a tough time of it. Now, it was the Chinese mainly, but also the Russians that were supporting the North Vietnamese against the Americans. So they were very concerned about any transfer of technology that would be going from the West to the Russians. A factory like this, which was set up to make cars, could very quickly be changed to be producing other things, perhaps for the war. Now, official White House documents detail a meeting between Professor Valletta, who was then the managing director of Fiat, and Franklin Roosevelt, who wasn't yet president. He was director of the Office for Economic Opportunities in the US. In this meeting, they discuss the circumstances around Fiat's investment. Roosevelt specifically asks Valletta how the Russians are going to pay for the involvement of the Italians in this project because the Russians had no foreign currency. And Valletta confirms that payment for this work is going to be provided in oil. Okay, so in that case, why was the Alpha Sud so rusty and even worse, quite significantly worse than other Alfa Romeos? Well, Achille Moroni was sent by Alfa Romeo in the 1970s to have a look at the plant and see what was going on because Alfa Romeo, this whole escapade with the Alfa Sud was costing Alfa Romeo millions and they were just as keen as anyone else to put a stop to it. He went down to that factory and in the book Alfa Romeo gli anni di Arese, he details the things that he found in the production line that would explain why these cars were so rusty. He confirms in the interview in the book that the same sheets of metal that were used in Arese, that, that is in the north of Italy and factories in the north, were used in the Alfa Sud. So they used the same metal but rusted much, much more. In the book, Moroni specifically says that he had heard the rumour about Russian steel and had found absolutely no evidence of that whatsoever. He says that the reason why there was this problem with rust was with the absolutely terrible working practices that were used in that factory. This was down to various reasons. Some of the main ones, some of the main things he found was that there were frequent sort of micro strikes at the factory. It said that in its run of about, of the Alpha Sud for seven or eight years production, 
there were over 700 strikes. Now, what would happen is that the bodies were originally, once they had been assembled, they were covered in a wax oil to preserve them. Just before paint, that wax oil or that wax was washed off. They were then put through the ovens. Because the strikes were so frequent, once they were put through the ovens, if the ovens were stopped halfway or it didn't finish the baking process, the bodies developed a lot of condensation and the rust began before they were even fully painted. He also complains of poor motivation and working practices and in his book, Un Motore per il Sud, which is a motor for the South by Giuseppe Pesce, Pesce says that actually the first workers that were recruited for the Pumigliano plant were from the very bricklayers who made the building. So you can see how, you know, the lack of training that was involved. Of course, they were subsequently supposedly trained to work on the car factory, but there was no tradition of that kind of work in that area. Now, how was it possible for the situation to develop to this point where the factory was run so badly with huge levels of absenteeism, little training and very little motivation? Well, Rudolf Huska, who was designer of the Alpha Sud, was fantastically capable. He was very handy as a racer. He'd had a design, a hand in the design while he worked at Porsche for the Beetle and for the Tiger Tank. And he went to Italy in 1959 and started working with Alfa Romeo. He was given the task of setting up the Pumigliano factory and running it. He was very charismatic. And I think that to begin with, the project started to go pretty well. However, in typical Italian style, in 1963, there started to be some infighting. Alfa Romeo needed and wanted to increase production in Arese. They were producing about 650 cars a day then and demand was for up to a thousand. So they applied for funding to extend the factory. However, Ciriaco de Mica, who was an MP at the time for Avellini in Campania, looking out for his own interests, wanted a new factory to be put in his region instead of expanding the one in Arese. He got support from IRI, IRI, which was the Italian Institute for Economic Reconstruction. As a result, all the senior management of Alfa Romeo that opposed this plan were deposed. That included Husker. So, Pomigliano was from 1974 onwards essentially rudderless. Domenico Chirico, who was actually one of the head engineers at Alpha in the 1970s and 80s, is on the record in 2010 as saying that if Husker had remained in post, these problems would have been ironed out. The constant strikes then were one of the big features and one of the big things that were responsible for the poor quality of the production. But why were there such frequent strikes? One of the biggest mafia bosses in Italy, Raffaele Cutolo, or Cutolo, I'm Italian, but I'm not sure quite how to put the emphasis on the O on that one. He was in charge of the Neapolitan Camorra. He was said to be in control of over 10,000 men. He was in jail from the age of 21 until he died at 79, but that didn't stop him from being in charge of this hugely powerful gang. Now, at Pomigliano, the unions as in the rest of Italy, were all conquering and very, very strong. And control of the unions was fought over between the Camorra, i.e. Cutolo, and the communists. Now, it is said that at the time, if the workers wanted to get a job at Pumigliano, they had to pay a bribe to the Mafia. So the Camorra and the Socialist Party fought over control of the unions and because a lot of the workers had paid to get their jobs, they didn't really feel the, necess the necessity to always turn up. Now, I don't want to blame the workers for all the problems at Pumigliano. Clearly, that's not the case. I think there was also a cultural thing. So many of them had parallel jobs. And when they, when they had, for example, a harvest like the potato harvest, they simply wouldn't turn up to the production line. There was also transport problems in that the local infrastructure wasn't geared up to deliver them on time when they needed for factory hours at Pumigliano. So if they had to take the train to go to work, it wouldn't turn up at the correct times. So I think we can definitely say that at least until the Fiat takeover in 1986, it is a fallacy. It is wrong to say that Alfa Romeo has used Russian steel. But what about Fiat? Fiat also suffered uh, from a reputation for 
poor rust proofing, but in particular it was Lancia with the beta that really suffered and indeed it caused Lancia to leave the UK market because that was such a big issue. When it comes to Fiat, it's much harder to prove one way or the other whether they used Soviet steel or not. It's not quite as clear cut as with Alpha. After all, it was a private company and also it did do that deal with Russia. However, if we go back to the meeting between the chairman of Fiat and Roosevelt, it is made quite clear there in writing that the payment would be made in oil, not in steel. Also in Chris Martin's book, he's found some evidence from an Italian radio station that did a feature on when that steel plant in Taranto closed. And they had found something indicating that Fiat had made a commitment to Taranto that it would stop producing its own steel and would source steel for its own cars as well from that factory in the south of Italy. So it looks like the same steel was being used both for Alfa Romeo and for Fiat, and it wasn't from the Soviet Union. Ultimately, I think that the truth is much less palatable for an Italian like me. This had nothing to do with Soviet steel. It was simply that we, as Italians, just didn't build these cars properly. Now, if you know different, then please do contact me. Instagram is the best way. If you have any links to any documents proving that any Soviet steel ever entered the Italian sort of system, then I would love to see that. If you enjoyed this, then please also have a look at the Alpha Sud video. The link should be coming up shortly. And lastly, thank you all so much for watching and I really look forward to seeing you for the next video.